uh, because uh, the whole 24th and 25th chapter are what we call the Olivet Discourse. Sometimes a lot of people get confused when they're reading chapter 24 and 25 because you have what we call the second advent. And those that were in Sunday school when we taught the book of Revelation, you remember some of this. But there is what we call the second advent. What is the second advent? Well, the second advent, let me jump back a little bit. What was the first advent? The first advent was when Jesus came to earth and was born there uh, or became man uh, in that little town of Bethlehem where the Bible tells us back in the Old Testament the exact location where he would be born. That is the first advent. Let's say that together. Advent. All right. Now there's a second advent when Jesus will come again. But in that second advent there are two comings. The first coming is what we call the rapture. Let's say that together. The rapture, okay? Now, the second part of the second advent is when he comes is the revelation. Let's say that together. The revelation. Now, in order for you to kind of distinguish those two comings that, you're, that are covered in chapter 20 and 25, 24 and 25, once again, which many people get mixed up because you also have an event that takes place in there called the tribulation period. And so a lot of people in their theology get those areas mixed up when they're reading along that line. It's just like this. Let me illustrate. If you were to go back to the book of uh, Isaiah, there in the book of Isaiah, one verse, you can be in the, the, uh, the timing of that particular period of time. Then it would throw you all the way to the future of what we call the millennial period, which is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth after the tribulation period. And so a lot of people, when they come to the Olivet Discourse, they're reading one verse and they, they, and they get mixed up. Well, I want to kind of straighten that out tonight because it's very simple to understand if you understand the thoughts of the second advent. Now, the second advent is the rapture. Let's say it is the rapture and the revelation, okay? Now, how do we distinguish between those two uh, happenings in the second advent? Remember the first advent? Jesus, he comes to this world in human flesh and dwelt among us and we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. The way to distinguish the rapture and the revelation is this. Jesus in the rapture comes for his saints. Let's say that together. He comes for his saints, all right? That's when we're called up to be with the Lord in the air. Jesus does not come all the way to the earth. He comes in the air and we're called up to him. The dead in Christ shall rise first. You're familiar with that. And then we which are alive shall be called up to be with the Lord. All right? The catching away, the Bible calls it. You'll not find the word rapture in the Bible. It's the terminology. All right? The second thing that takes place in this discourse of the Olivet Discourse that Jesus is explaining to his disciples is the revelation. The revelation is when Jesus comes with his saints. Let's say that. He comes with his saints. And he comes all the way to the earth. And last week I told you when he comes to the earth, he will plant his feet upon the Mount of Olives. That's where we get the Olivet course, Discourse when Jesus was teaching his disciples and those that stood around and sat around and listened to it. 24, we looked at last week, and so if you look there, the first verses of that chapter are very important because it deals with a little bit of what's going to transpire in his coming because of the fact he wanted to help us not to be deceived by the devil. And one of the biggest things, are you listening? One of the biggest things the devil is deceiving people about is that you have plenty of time or he's not coming. 
He's not coming. I mean, after all, all these years, these preachers been preaching that Jesus is going to come and they begin to scoff. Well, Peter told us that would happen. All right? He is coming again. So don't be deceived in the fact and don't become weary of the fact of hearing about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So he covers that in the verses that we talked about last week. We talked about the, uh, the fact of, the, uh, uh, of Jerusalem uh, being destroyed in 70 AD by the Titus, uh, uh, by Titus, the Roman general. And then we moved on to the fact of the, uh, the, of the Antichrist and the deception of false prophets and so on. Then he comes to verse number 15 and he begins to talk about a part of what we call the tribulation period. If you look at verse 15, he wants us to understand some things that are going to transpire during the tribulation period. So he's jumping back and forth between the rapture, the tribulation period, and the revelation of Jesus Christ that he will come before what we call the millennial period of a thousand years will start taking place. Look at verse 15. He says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Now look up here if you would, very quickly. Now I'm giving you this uh, introduction very quickly. Then I'm going to give you some things that will help you and I as we think about the second advent with two things that are going to take place, the rapture and revelation. The abomination of desolation will take place after the revelation. Are you with me? It would come, when Jesus comes to the earth, the abomination will take place in the tribulation period. What is the abomination of desolation? The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist, who will step on the scene after the tribulation period. Now he could, uh, and I think uh, my opinion uh, is that he will be on earth, the earth before the tribulation period begins. All right? The tribulation period is a time of tribulation. And it will be primarily a time when the people of Israel will take and they will preach the gospel. Matter of fact, if you were to go, and we're not going to have you go there, to the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 7, when there will be 144,000 preachers those will be Jewish preachers. They will preach the kingdom message of salvation. And my personal opinion is this. Only at that time, only at that time will Jewish people get saved. Now that's my personal opinion. They're not preaching to the Gentile. Why? Because we are in the age of the Gentile. When the gospel is being preached primarily to the Gentile, though we know there are Jewish people that are getting saved. Jesus, at the very beginning of the tribulation period, is where? He is with us in heaven. We have what we call the judgment seat of Christ that takes place, and it's going to be a seven-year period. There's going to be something going on earth on the earth. That will be the tribulation. In heaven will be the judging of the saints. And at the end of that seven years, there will be what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? Does that help you a little bit? Now, I could give you a lot more detail, but we're not going into that tonight. All right. Now, when the tribulation period begins, the devil, through the Antichrist, will step on the scene. How long it will take, I do not know, but I believe approximately three and a half years there will be the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We call it the tribulation temple, okay? We could go back through all the temples that have been built. The last one there is Herod's temple. And it was destroyed there. Then we have what we call the tribulation uh, temple. What's going to happen... The Antichrist, when the temple is built, there will be a sacrifice that will be offered unto God. When the people of Israel 
go in to offer this sacrifice by the high priest unto God, the Antichrist will step on the scene and he will say, offer that sacrifice to me. That's the abomination of desolation. God has given us a picture of what's going to happen at the ra rapture, at the tribulation, and at the revelation. And the part of it is right here in uh, Matthew chapter number 24. Now, as we go into this chapter, in this Olivet Discourse, sometimes it can be difficult to understand. But look at verse 27, if you would. This is talking about the revelation. All right? The revelation is when Jesus will come to earth. Rapture, he comes in the air, we're caught up to be with the Lord. Now, look there if you, if you would. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation, do you get that point? Everybody see it? After the tribulation, immediately, those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of the heaven to the other. Now, the thought he's trying to give us, give us here is this. Yes, and some people really get it mixed up. They say, the trumpet's not going to sound at the coming in the rapture. Yes, there's going to be a trumpet at the rapture. Uh, whenever the Lord wanted to get people's attention, there was always a trumpet sounded. All right? Will it be for war or for to get the people's attention? All right? You, if you were to go to the Holy Lands, and Brother Ed's been there, I've never been there. I've read a lot about it, studied a lot about it. But they have a horn. It's a, a, a horn off of a goat. And that thing, when it sounds, it's loud. And it's a call for attention. And the attention at the rapture is a catching up. All right? Uh, let's go back to Revelation chapter, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4. Would you turn there real quickly? Now keep your place in chapter number 25, 24 and 25, because I'll come back there in just a minute. Now there's a reason I'm giving you this preempt. Uh, introduction because of what I'm going to say in a few minutes uh, real quickly uh, in regards to the message. Alright, 1 Thessalonians and look at chapter 4 if you would please. Alright, starting down at verse number 13. He says, but I would not have you to be what? Ignorant. God wants you to have knowledge because there's some principles he wants to get across to your heart and my heart in regards as Christians that we do the right thing. He says, uh, look, uh, don't be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus has died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now read verse 16 with me, would you please? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Amen. Say it again. Amen. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet who? Jesus. Where at? In the air, not on the earth. We're at the rapture of the church, the catching away of the people of God because they're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. That's the key thought, from the wrath to come. There's a wrath that's going to come down upon this earth like never has been known throughout all ages. Even the flood, that was a great traumatic thing. But think about the wrath of God is going to come down upon man and uh, it's going to be terrible. And you've read Revelation and I have to go into that. Now turn back if you would. By the way, let me read the last verse there. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The comfort that God gives us because we know and are not ignorant of what's going to transpire in the future. 
Now, simply because you and I are going to be raptured and we won't have to go through the tribulation period does not mean for us to lay back and be lazy and relaxed and become indifferent and cold to the things of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says, look, we're to be watchful, we're to be ready. And that's what he, why the chapter 24 and chapter 25 are all about is the matter of being watchful and being ready. Now, before Jesus was crucified, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he told his disciples to watch and do what? Pray. Two factors in being ready. Watching and praying. I'm afraid we have failed in both of them. We have not watched, we have not prayed, lest we enter in the temptation. Because we have let our lives become so tainted and tainted by this world that we become much like the world. And Jesus said, come out from among the world and be separate, saith the Lord. And God wants us to be a clean people. Matter of fact, he says, be ye holy as I am holy. Uh, when I was a little kid, many of you uh, probably got involved in this when you were a kid. But many of you probably played a game called hide and seek. Raise your hand if you did that. Raise your hand. I had to raise both of them because, man, that, we played a lot of that in, in town. All right? But that hide and seek, it was a game started and someone was chosen to be Come on, say this word. It. All right? And if you were it, you were designated to have a place that you were going to count to a designated number, and everybody else did what? They ran and hid. All right? And he counted that number, or he or she, and then uh, what he would do while he was looking for everybody, if you got back to the base, you were okay, right? But if you got caught, you were what? You were it, all right? And God wants us to be ready at all times. And God has given us a designated place, and that is our daily time of prayer to be ready. God wants us to pray. You see, prayer is a very important thing. Back in the back there, it says, the Lord's Prayer. How many of you have looked at the Lord's Prayer? Now, we know it's not the Lord's Prayer. It was a prayer to teach us how to pray, okay? How often have you looked at that prayer? One of the ma two major things that he brings out in that prayer is this. Number one, Lord thy will. Secondly, lead us not into temptation. Daily, we need to seek the Lord's will that we are ready, that we're not led into temptation and led away because, as I said last Sunday night, we believe, and I trust you do too, we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He could return at any time. Can I hear an amen? amen. We believe that. And an hour as you think not. Now, as you look in these scriptures, you'll find a mixture of thoughts that you and I have been taught for years. Some of them are in reference strictly to the, what we call the time of tribulation and the revelation. All right? For example, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. That does not refer to the rapture. But here's the point, and this is the thing that we have to get a hold of. If it's all called the second, are you listening? If it's all called the second event, if it happens in the revelation, how much more should we be ready in the rapture? Huh? Be ready. For in an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. So they go together. So don't, don't, get, uh, don't get mixed up in some of the theology that simply because it refers to the second thought, the revelation, don't think it can't apply also to the rapture. All right? Being ready. 
being watchful is the main thought that we don't get caught and we become it. God wants us to be ready at all times. So let me give you some thoughts here very quickly tonight that might help you in regards to these both thoughts here because there's many things that we can study. It would take us probably the next two months to really study in depth chapter 20 and 24 and 25. So I'm hitting the basics that helps you to kind of get some theology in place. So in the rendering of the chapter 24 and 25 Olivet Discourse, what does God want you and I to learn to help us in regards to this second advent? Now, before I ask that, uh, answer that question, God in the Old Testament, all the way up through, gave warning after warning after warning and information after information concerning the first advent. Amen? Even to the extent that he said that he would be virgin born and he would be born in the little town of where? Bethlehem. Now, God is not vague in regards to giving us information also concerning the second advent. So what does he want us to learn in regards as a warning and to be watchful and praying and being ready to for the Lord's coming in the air for us. First of all, number one, put it down. It's a time to take heed. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke chapter 21. You're in Matthew. Turn over to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21. And I've got to move. I've got about 15 minutes here I want to share with you. And I want you to listen very carefully. And I think it will help you concerning this 24th and 25th chapter. Look there if you would at Luke chapter 21. And look down at verse number 34. Verse 34 says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged uh, with uh, surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon your, you unawares. Now, what day is he talking about? The rapture of the church. All right? It can come up on you unawares because you're not taking heed to what God has to say. Look at verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in that day time he was uh, teaching in the temple and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of what? Olives. It's a time of taking heed and checking up on our life to say, wait a minute. How's my life measure up to what the Word of God has to say? Folks, this Bible is to help us to stay clean and pure and right before God. Can I hear an amen? God wants us to follow the precepts of His Word. There's a second thing I want to give you. So if you turn back to Matthew chapter 25, it's a time of preparation. Look at Matthew 25. Now, I'm not going to read the whole uh, verses there. You're familiar with the story, and you're familiar with the example that he gives. He gives an example of uh, some virgins uh, which had lamps, some had taken oil, and some hadn't. Now, look at verse 1. It says, Then shall the king, I'm back in chapter 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to a ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Who is the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. All right. Now, and five of them were wise and five were what? Now, he gives a balance here by using the word, the term five. He's showing that some people are going to be ready and prepared. Some of them aren't going to be ready and prepared. God wants us to be watching, working, prepared each and every day in our life. Amen. He doesn't want us to be off guard in regards to his coming. Why? Number one, we become lax in our lives. We become lax in our life as far as being ready for his coming. Uh, a bride, when she's getting ready uh, to get married, she wants everything prepared just right. Amen? 
I mean, she's gone. She's bought that dress. And I mean, it's been tailored. Everything is just right. She wants to make sure that all the dainties of the, the wedding uh, party are going to be right. Everything. They've gone and they've had counseling. Uh, by the way, it's a good thing when you get married. You ought to get some counsel from your pastor or a good counselor. Okay? So that's been done. They bought all this. They've got all the, uh, the bridesmaids. They've got all the groomsmen, so forth and so on, the best men, so forth. Everything's been prepared. They're ready for the wedding. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you take that same perspective in regards to the fact that we're the bridegroom? I mean, we're the bride of Christ. Now, I'm not talking, don't get me wrong. I have to say something here real quickly. There's a group of Baptists thinks they're the, bra by they're the Baptist bride. Listen, if a person's born again, they're part of the bride. Okay, every born again believer. All right? Regardless of denomination. Now, I think there's some denominations that are off base. I don't think they're teaching the Bible. I think they're way off on some things. But there's still some people that are in those denominations that are saved, believe it or not. Huh? I'm glad about that because I was Nazarene. I'm a Baptist. Uh, somebody asked me uh, one time, if you weren't a Baptist, what would you be? I said, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm born again first. I'm a child of God. Amen? That's the most important thing. See, I'm a Baptist by choice. Okay? I'm not a Baptist in order to be saved. I'm glad about that. I'm glad God says, whosoever will may come. Can I hear an amen? Amen. All right. So, he says, look here. They were foolish uh, 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 virgins, there were wise virgins. And some of them didn't take their lamps trimmed with oil. They were not prepared. And God wants you and I to be prepared every day that if the Lord would come, hey, everything's all right. Everything's clear. See? Everything is before the Lord that he can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let me give you a, a third thing, real quickly. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44. It's a time to be ready and listening to God's warnings, all right? Look there, if you would, at uh, chapter uh, 24 of Matthew. Look down at verse number 44. He says, watch therefore, for you know not what. What hour your Lord doth come. Then jump to verse 40. I, I was up in 42, excuse me. Look down to verse 44 and read it with me. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, there's a verse in between there that's very important to get a hold of, and I've left that as the last of this particular section. Look at verse 43, and let's read it together. Here we go. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known and what watch the thief would come he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up he's given us what we call an urgency to watch our lives lest the thief who's the thief Savior. the devil cometh not but to steal kill and what destroy and John gave us that back in John chapter 10 when he says but I've come to give you life and give it to you more what abundantly. God wants us to live a full life, but he doesn't want us to live it on the measures and the scale and the rule of this world. He wants us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit and walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. So what does it mean to be ready? Well, it means to be ready. I mean, like I'll say to my wife, are you ready yet? She's not ready yet. She gets ready, all right? In other words, she's got her, she's got, she's dressed. She's ready to go out the door, all right? And I'm standing there and waiting, all right? But she's ready to leave, see? I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to leave tonight if the Lord would come? That's what he means. All right? But let me give you another thought here very quickly. By the, by the way, let me mention this very quickly, and I, I'm not going to go over tonight. But uh, this matter of being ready, uh, I gave you the word a while ago, watchfulness. There's another thing, 
prayerfulness. Another thing, faithfulness. Another thing, warning against careless living. Another thing, warning concerning iniquity or sin in our lives. There's another thing that God says, guarding against lukewarmness. Let me park there for a second. I bring that out because right now, in what we call uh, church history, we're in what we call the Laodicean age. You'll find that in the book of Revelation, one of the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. What was their problem? Lukewarmness. Having, you know, a testimony, but denying the power of God. Becoming so wrapped up with the things of the world. Now, we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. We don't be like, have to be like the world. You see, uh, we, we're not here to be odd. I mean, uh, uh, God doesn't want us to be odd. He wants us to be different. I, I told you this before when I went to Tennessee Temple University. The thing that drew me to Tennessee Temple University was they were called distinctively or different, distinctively Christian. Being distinct. God wants us to be distinct in this world. God wants us to be watchful and not lukewarm. And then be loving and not grudging. The book of James says, Be not, be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. That means imminence. He's getting ready to come through it. And he can come through at any time. We need to be ready. Let me give you another thought. Look over to chapter 25 and look at verse number 14. It's time of reckoning. It's a time of reckoning right now. God says, let's take stock. Look there at uh, chapter 25 and uh, down in verse number 14, if you look there, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling in the far country who calls his own servants and delivers them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, another two, and another one, to every man according to his servile ability, and straightway took his journey. And jump down to verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Uh, all of us have had this scenario in our life. Whether it be a dad, whether it be somebody that's close to us, and uh, they've gone away. And they said, I'll see you in a week, or I'll see you in a, 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 a few hours, or whatever it might be. When he returns, he wants to be welcomed. Amen? Amen. And we have to give an account. For example, if we're a kid and we've done something wrong, guess what? Mama says, when Daddy returns, something's going to happen. He's going to judge, right? I mean, he's going to lower the boom, or he's going to say, well, I'm glad you were good today, and uh, by the way, I picked something up for you. He gives them. God, one of these days, when he comes... Now, of course, I'm talking to the person of Jesus Christ. When we go to heaven, guess what? We're going to get rewards, amen? Or we're going to not get rewards. God wants us to have a time of reckoning every day in our life to make sure that we're doing what he has for our lives. You see, being watchful does not mean we sit back in a rocking chair and say, well, I hope we come, you know, real soon. No, it's doing at the same time. It's working. It's serving. It's loving others. And so it's a time of reckoning. And he gives that picture here in the scripture I just gave you. Uh, look down to verse number 42, if you would. 42. For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. What is he talking about there? He's saying, you and I have all kinds of opportunities now as a Christian. Amen, Brother Ed? We have all kinds of opportunity to pass out the gospel tract. You ought to be carrying gospel tracts in your pocket and giving them to people and sharing them, the gospel with them. Uh, we have an opportunity of serving in different capacities and, and doing the things that God wants us to do now. Folks, one of these days, it's going to be too late. That's right. 
And so it's, it's a time for you and I to get serious about the things of God. Because he draweth nigh. He's coming again. And we're challenged to watch and to pray and to be faithful unto him. What does it mean to watch? Well, the word means to keep awake, to be attentive, to be ready. It has an idea of a watchman who dares not fall asleep, but he's about watching for the souls of men and women, boys and girls, and doing the work of the Lord and being faithful in his own capacity as a Christian. God wants us to be ready. And that's what this whole Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is getting to. Jesus is coming and we need to be on alert. And the biggest thing is this. God wants us. And I know you hear this, but sometimes it doesn't get home to our hearts and minds. All of us have loved ones and friends that need to be saved. And we need to share with them the gospel and tell them that time is short and Jesus could come again. And a lot of churches have quit preaching about the second coming of Christ. Folks, it's in the Bible. We need to preach it. We need to teach it. We need to give people the hope of heaven. Turn over to John chapter 14. Let me close with this scripture. You've read it so often that sometimes we let it pass over our thinking on a daily measure. Uh, John chapter 14. Look there if you would. And I'd like for you to read it with me. We're going to read uh, down through verse number 6 that we're very familiar with. But sometimes we pass over verse number 3 and forget what Jesus is doing right now. And he could be finishing up what he went there back to heaven to do. Look at it. Verse 1, chapter 14. Here we go. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have what? Told you. I go to prepare a what? A place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will do what? Let's say it again. I will come again and do what? Receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Folks, that's what we must continually share with people is that scripture that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And while we have time, we need to prepare other people for the coming again of Jesus Christ. So chapter 24 and 25, the whole two chapters, though it covers one event, there's two sections in it called the rapture and the revelation. And don't get confused with the material there. But all of it shows us, listen, the urgency of being ready. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, let me ask you a very important question. Number one, are you ready in your heart you know that you're saved and that you know you'll go to heaven when Jesus comes again if you know that 100% sure and you know you're saved I'm not saying did you pray a little old prayer but you meant what you asked Jesus to do and you believed he saved you and you're going to heaven and if you were to die tonight or if Jesus would come, you would go home to be with the Lord. Can you raise your hand with me tonight? Say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. All right, God bless you. Put your hands down. Now, I didn't do that to embarrass anybody in case there was somebody here that could not raise their hand. But let me say this to you, dear friend. If you are here and you did not raise your hand, I encourage you tonight accept Christ as your Savior. You say, Preacher, what should I do in order to do that? If you will simply be willing, number one, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God.
that he came and he died upon that cross to pay the price for your sin when he shed his blood because the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no payment for sin and you will be willing in your heart to say Lord I know I'm a sinner I believe Jesus died for me I believe you are the Son of God come into my life and save me from my sin Friend, if you do that tonight, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. God will save you right now. And nobody looking, and I'll not approach you. But was there anybody here tonight? They prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to save them. Would you just put your hand up in the air and put it right back down? Anyone at all? Anybody at all? How many of you here tonight say, Preacher, if Jesus were to come again as a Christian, I know I'm ready because I know my life is right with the Lord. I'm doing His will. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm doing His will, and I'm living the right type of life by the power of the Holy Spirit because all of us are susceptible to sin. We're capable of doing any sin. But by God's grace, I know that everything's all right between me and the Lord. Can you raise your hand? Say, I'm ready if the Lord were to come tonight. Can you raise your hand tonight? If not, and once again, I don't know who did raise their hand or who did not raise their hand. But maybe you need to say, Lord, I want to be right with you. I want everything to be ready. I want to keep watching for you daily and living by your power the right type of Christian life that I may honor you with. Now, Father in heaven, I pray you take your word tonight. Touch each one of us. That we let scripture be a warning and a an help and encouragement for our lives as we wait for Jesus to come again. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's the invitation.